for the message. It's the same notes from last week. If you'd like to take some notes, we have a handout for you, Brother Chris, in the back. Just make eye contact with him or raise a hand, and he can get you a copy of those notes. If you don't want notes, that's okay. They won't offend me at all, all right? Uh, but Acts chapter number 1 is where we're at, and it will be in verses 12 through the end of the chapter. A really fitting passage, I think, as we head into Missions Week, uh, Missions Conference Week. We just sang that song, Lord, Give Me a Tender Heart. Um, you know, all of these missionaries that are coming uh, really came to a juncture in their life where they had to make a decision. Am I going to go to the mission field or am I going to stay? And uh, they went through a process of discerning what is it that God wants me to do? What is God's will for my life? And that's really the subject that we began last week, discerning God's will. And as we mentioned last week, these disciples, these apostles are there with 120 other believers, or they're part of the 120. They're gathered in the upper room. Uh, you remember in the first part of the book of Acts that Jesus ascends into heaven. He gives the disciples the commission, the apostles this commission to be witnesses under the uttermost part of the earth, beginning in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And uh, before they go out in this commission, they are to wait. How many days were they to wait? Ten days. I heard it down here. Ten days. Jesus had been with them for 40 days, and he was going to commission them to go out once the Spirit came. But that wasn't going to happen until chapter 2, verse number 1. That's Pentecost. And uh, I think my uh, college professor used to say, Emmanuel was God with us. Um, the cross is God for us, and Pentecost is God in us. And, uh, and so that's one-time events, Jesus' birth, the incarnation, the cross, and then Pentecost. Those are one-time events. We don't wait for a baptism or renewal of the Holy Spirit. Uh, after we get saved, we are baptized into the Spirit, so to speak, at the moment that we get saved and the Spirit dwells within us. But that hadn't happened yet historically until Acts chapter number 2. So they're waiting for this event. And these 10 days, they're going to continue in prayer. Notice verses 12 through 14 again. The Bible says, These all continue, these 120 with one accord in prayer and supplication. He mentions who's there, the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in verse number 15, Peter is going to get up, and he's going to stand in the midst of his disciples, and he's going to speak. But as their pattern was for those 10 days, they continued in prayer and in supplication. We mentioned last week that prayer was their petitioning. Supplication was the earnestness of their petitioning. They were asking God for help in this commission that they had been given to take the gospel to the uttermost part of the earth. And really, as we looked at this passage of scripture, we, we, we um, uh, illustrated that this passage was a historical event. But for us, the practical value is that how these apostles made decisions, discerned the will of God, we can learn from this passage on how to make decisions in our own life as well. And so the practical value of this passage could be that we have pointers on how to make decisions. We all make decisions. You made decisions this week. Some decisions were more important than other decisions. Maybe this coming year, you'll have some big decisions to make. Decisions determine our direction. And we want to make sure our decisions are lined up with what God wants us to do. And these apostles are about to make a huge decision. They're going to find a, a replacement for the disciple who betrayed Jesus, Judas Iscariot. And before they make this decision, they make sure they get the heart of God and the ear of God on this decision. So they do certain things and we can really follow their pattern and when we make decisions in our life as well. We looked at last week, we won't go through that message again, but the first pointer, the first way we can discern God's will or what discerning God's will requires is number one, the continuance of prayer, the continuance of prayer. Uh, the apostles, when they got to the upper room, they were in one accord, they were in unison in praying and supplicating. In other words, they were on the same page. They had the same drive, they had the same intention, they had the same desires, and that was to get the heart of God. And so they're going to come to a point in verses really 15 through the rest of the chapter where they have to make a crucial decision. And it's interesting that even before they make the decision or get to the place that they need to make a decision... Their pattern has been they have already been praying. Now let me just stop right there and encourage you. You know what happens when we have to make a decision? That's when we go to God and say, oh, I really need to pray about this. You know, we don't have often a habit of consistent, urgent prayer. And so when the decision comes, we just continue how we've been continuing in prayer. Often it's, you know, my prayer life's okay. It's, you know, I do it because I need to do it. And then when the decision comes, oh, I'm going to spend extra time in prayer. 
And you'll find that these disciples, they were already continuing in their urgency of prayer. So it was just natural when the decision came, they would just continue in the same pattern. Hey, don't pray when you only have a need. That's not how it works. We're supposed to pray because that's what God wants us to do, to get his heart, to commune with him. And so these disciples are going to be brought, brought to a point where they have to make this important decision. And God's given us these incredible pointers and markers, guides that help us discern as well. So we looked at, number one, the continuance of prayer. Number two, I want you to see tonight that another way we discern God's will is the compatibility of Scripture. The compatibility of the Scriptures. Notice verse number 15 again. And in those days, in one of these days of the ten days, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about 120, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. Notice what he says. He says, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. One man said the prayer meeting came before the business meeting. They were already praying, asking the Lord for help and making this decision. And then one man steps up, the leader among them, Peter, and he says, Listen, we have to make a decision that lines up with what the Scriptures says. In this assembly of 120, there is someone that is missing. This really would have been the elephant in the room. Who is the individual that is missing? The traitor, Judas Iscariot. I think this passage does a number of things. Number one, it really brings us to a measure of closure on the life of Judas. We often wonder, Jesus had 12, but one man betrayed him. How does Judas fit into the overarching story of the Bible? How does that really reconcile? How does that really make sense? So I think this story, Luke records it for us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to kind of give us some closure on the life of Judas Iscariot. But I think a second reason, maybe even more primary as to why this is given... And I'll quote a commentator that helps us to understand this. He said this, Even the most horrendous, unthinkable apostasy by one of the twelve apostles of Jesus Christ cannot in any sense delay or thwart the continuing progress of God's plan. Even betrayal at the most intimate level is no surprise to God. Just think about that. Oftentimes, if you look at the scripture almost from a human lens, you might think, oh, the betrayal of Judas, that works counterintuitively to God's plan in getting the gospel out. But really, we, ought, we shouldn't think of it that way. Even the greatest mistakes by humankind can still work together for good in God's perfect plans. And I think that's why this story is given. Even though there was a man that betrayed Jesus himself, it didn't catch God by surprise. It wasn't something that just God was taken back by. No, it works out in his ultimate plan. There are systems of theology and doctrine and teaching that try to reconcile these two great truths. And the first great truth is the sovereignty of God, that God knows everything. It's all part of his master plan. It works together for good. God will ultimately fulfill all of his purposes. This is the sovereignty of God. And then over here, you have the free will of man. You have men that are able to make decisions and choices that are contrary to right. And how does the free will of man and the responsibility of man work together harmoniously with the sovereignty of God. And pastor's given a number of illustrations to, to help us understand that the ship one is the one I often think of. So how do we reconcile the sovereignty of God, that God knows everything, it's all part of his plan? How does Judas even figure into that? And the free will of man, where Judas made a decision contrary to what God ultimately would want. He sinned. God doesn't want anyone to sin. How does that all fit together? You know, I really don't know how to explain it to you in the perfect way, how we reconcile the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. But I can tell you this, Scripture presents both truths, and they somehow biblically work together. Uh, I have to quote a man named C.H. Spurgeon when he was asked about the same thing. It's found in a book that I read this week. He said this when he was approached on how to reconcile the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. How do those things reconcile? He said this, quote, I wouldn't try. He replied, and listen to this, I never reconcile friends. Friends? Yes, friends. This is the point that we have to grasp. In the Bible, divine sovereignty and human responsibility are not enemies. They're not uneasy neighbors. They are not in an endless state of cold war with each other. They're friends, and they work together. You don't have to reconcile friends because by very definition, they're Together, they're friends. 
And so Peter is going to stand up and this atrocity of human will, Judas's betrayal, and yet it's all somehow fits together with the sovereignty of God. It reconciles together, and Peter is going to reconcile them with Scripture. I want you to notice here in verse number 15, in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names were there, together there were about 120, men and brethren, this Scripture must needs be fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained a part of this ministry. He's going to quote two passages, Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. And they both relate to this problem, the problem of the betrayal and defection of Judas Iscariot. Did God know that Judas was going to betray Jesus? He did. He did. Even Jesus said that there was going to be a betrayer among the twelve. It was spoken of even in the Old Testament that there would be a betrayer. So it was in God's ultimate plan. He knew that it would take place. And even David, through this Holy Spirit's inspiration, wrote Psalm 69 and wrote Psalm 109. And in those prophetic psalms, he speaks of Judas Iscariot. It's amazing to me, as I mentioned several weeks ago, how the apostles were able to make so many connections with the Old Testament scriptures and what was happening right before their eyes. And Luke 24 tells us that Jesus himself opened their understanding so they would make those connections from the Old and the New Testament. Verse 16 tells us this. Peter stood up and said, Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled. Now, you don't really use that kind of language. You don't say something must needs have been. At least I don't think you use that phrase. Must needs have been fulfilled. It's an interesting conglomeration of various words, and I think the, the translators did a phenomenal job because what's going on the original language is a little bit complex. Here's what's happening. Luke, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is using two different tenses, and he is putting them together. That's why it sounds a little bit odd in the English language. Must, needs, have been. And really what he's saying is this. The scripture will be fulfilled, and it is in the process of being fulfilled. All right, so those two great tenses are going together when, when Luke is writing this. In other words, that implies two things. Number one, it was a necessity that Scripture must be fulfilled. In other words, not a single prophecy of Scripture will fall short. Peter was affirming the sufficiency and the concrete authority of the Bible. He was saying every Old Testament passage that you find will come to pass. Must needs. And then he says, have been. This doesn't just apply necessity. It implies completion. Have been fulfilled. What Peter is saying is what is going on before our eyes is the fulfillment of prophecy. It has been fulfilled. And what we're doing right now is the very fulfillment of that same prophecy. These are some rich, rich truths that Peter is speaking about concerning the scriptures. He is basing his authority on the word of God. So Judas's actions and really the decision now in this passage to replace Judas as an apostolic witness for the, min for the ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus is a full fulfillment of scriptures. Here's my point. The sovereignty of God, God's plan, God spoke a thousand years before this was being written through the mouth of David, through the Holy Spirit's inspiration that Judas would be a betrayer, the sovereignty, the plan of God. And yet Judas made a choice. He is responsible for his choice in sinning against God and betraying Jesus. They both work harmoniously together. And scripture says so. So we believe it. We believe it. I want you to look at verse 17 again. For he, speaking of Judas, was numbered. Peter is speaking. He was numbered with us. He was counted with us. He was a part of us and had obtained part of this ministry. He's speaking specifically about the apostolic ministry they had. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. Now I'm going to be honest with you. These are some pretty gruesome details that you're going to read. Uh, and they're pretty graphic in nature. I think Peter is illustrating a point. And he says this, This man, Judas, purchased a field with the reward of his iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, 
and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, in so much as the field is called in the proper tongue, Akeldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, this is Psalm 69, let this habitation be desolate. And now he's going to quote Psalm 109, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Judas, we know, was the betrayer. He was looking for an opportunity to betray Christ, and he had his opportunity that night that Jesus was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was a one that was counted as part of the apostleship. But although Judas was, uh, was part of the followers of Jesus, he didn't buy in. He wasn't a true believer. He had never truly placed his faith in Jesus Christ. And even Jesus foretold of his betrayal. And the overwhelming guilt of Judas after Jesus was betrayed led him to go back to those sheep priests whom he was, of whom he was given 30 pieces of silver. And he threw down the 30 pieces of silver. And he went out from that place, the, the Gospel of Matthew tells us, so overwhelmed with the guilt. Yet Peter, when he denied Jesus, he was overwhelmed with guilt and he wept with repentance and got right with God. But Judas chose not to do that. Instead, the overwhelming sense of guilt. Instead of getting right with God, God would have given him mercy. God would have given him grace. God would have given him another chance. But rather than doing that, he went out, the Bible says, and he hung himself. He committed suicide. Let me just say this, church. Sin always promises you something that it can never pay. He was promised 30 pieces of silver, but sin costs Judas his life. Sin always costs something. And often the consequences are dire. You know, in Matthew 27, the Bible says that the priests saw that money on the ground. They picked up that money and they realized we can't put this money back into the treasury of the temple because there's blood on this money, figuratively speaking. This is blood money. And so the Bible says in Matthew 27 that the chief priests bought a field. And here in Acts, uh, chapter number one, it says that Judas purchased the field. So the liberal scholars will say, see, there's a contradiction in the God's word. And it's not really a contradiction, really. It's just harmony. It's just perspective. The chief priest used Judas's money. It was still Judas's money that he was given to buy this field. And so whether it wasn't Judas directly buying it, but he really did purchase it. So Matthew 27 and Acts 1, there is no contradiction. They work together in harmony. But I want you to focus in on verse number 20, where Peter speaks of these two passages. Psalm 69, Psalm 109. The Bible says, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let this habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein. Here's Psalm 109, and let his bishopric, that word bishopric means his overseeing position, his position of being an apostle, be given or let another take. Now, in preparation for this message, I read Psalm 69 and I read Psalm 109. If you were to go home this week and you were to read Psalm 69 and you were to read Psalm 109 and you somehow made the connection Oh, it's obviously talking about Judas. Come talk to me. Because when you read Psalm 69 and read Psalm 109, the way that Peter made that connection baffles my mind. Because you read that passage and David is obviously talking about his enemies, the, the hardships he was going through, the sufferings he was going through, through, and he's talking about his present circumstances. And all of a sudden, Peter, it's as if he just pulls his verse out of context. It seems that way. And he's saying, this is talking about Judas. To us, we may not see the connection, but remember, church, who was with Peter and the apostles for 40 days teaching the Old Testament scriptures and specifically teaching how it ultimately pointed to Christ. Who was with him? Jesus himself. And so I don't think Peter is taking any passage out of scripture. I think even uh, whether it was by divine guidance or whether it was Jesus himself, the apostles always quote the Old Testament scriptures in perfect context. And so they're quoting Psalm, he's quoting Psalm 69, and he's quoting Psalm 109 in its perfect context. They point to Jesus Christ. Understand this about principle, basic principle about Old Testament prophecy. Often prophecy had a near fulfillment that came to pass historically, and oftentimes it had a far fulfillment that will one day come to pass or did one day come to pass. In fact, if you were to go to the next chapter, Joel uh, uh, Acts chapter number 2, Peter's going to quote Joel. And that same discussion can be had there where there's a near fulfillment in the days of Joel. And there's another fulfillment in the days of Peter and probably a far fulfillment in the end times during the millennium. And so there are these various lenses by which you must see 
prophecy, and the Bible gives us some help on doing that. And especially when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, it's always doing it in perfect context. So that gives us some, some principal help. And so here it is. Peter is looking at this passage in the Old Testament, and he is seeing Scripture clearly. Obviously, someone was teaching him, whether it was God himself or Jesus in those 40 days, and he's saying, this is Scripture, and this Scripture must, needs, have been fulfilled. Here's the application for us, church. We're not going to have to make a decision on electing another apostle. Okay, that, that's not what we're doing, all right? We'll never have to do that. That office has passed off the scenes. But you have real life decisions to make. You have real life choices to make. And may I encourage you, never make a decision without consulting the principles and precepts of the Word of God. That's what Peter's doing. Peter's saying, listen, we have this decision to be made, but this decision is compatible with the scriptures. We are not making a decision that is outside the bounds of scriptures. In fact, the reason we are making this decision is because the scriptures must needs have been fulfilled. Do you see where the authority lies? Peter's not making a decision because he just wants to have another apostle or he feels pressure to have another apostle. No, he's making this decision with the, with the rest of the, uh, the people that are there because he is wanting to follow the Bible, the Bible. And so may I encourage you, when we discern God's will, we need to have continuance of prayer and the compatibility of Scripture. Never make a decision if it violates God's word, if it violates the principles of God's word. And so Peter knew that they had to choose a replacement for for Judas because the Bible said so, but the Bible does not give us a name. The Bible does not say Judas will be replaced and here's the guy that will replace them. It doesn't go that far. And so discerning God's will requires the continuance of prayer, the compatibility of the scriptures. But thirdly tonight, discerning his will requires the consultation of wisdom. The consultation of wisdom. I want you to notice verse 21. So Peter understands this is what the Bible says. But notice what he says in verse number 21. Wherefore. Okay, get that. That's an important word. Based on what the Bible says, based on what Scripture tells us, based on this, wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So Peter says... Based on the scriptures, we have to make this decision. And we're going to take the scriptures, the principles of scripture, and apply them to this situation right here. Whenever we take scripture, a principle of the Bible, and we apply it to our life in order to make a decision, do you know what that requires? It requires godly wisdom. In fact, we had an entire year where the theme was walking in Wisdom. Wisdom is taking the Bible and applying it to our everyday life. That's wisdom. And wisdom begins with God's word. Wisdom begins with his word. You'll see that in this verse, in verse number 21, that there was certain criteria that one of these men had to meet in order to be an apostle. Notice again, which of these men have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John. The criteria, and I wish I really could do an extended study on what an apostle is and what the office of the apostle was. That office doesn't exist today, but that office of the apostle had to meet certain criteria as God had spelled it out in his word. Um, there was no jobs.com where they could just put in a resume, hey, we need an apostle, fill out your apostolic resume, and we'll see if you make the cut, all right? There was nothing like that. They had to meet certain criteria, and one of the criteria they had to meet is that they had to have seen and been an ear witness and an eye witness of the risen Lord. There were those that were beginning from the baptism of John, had followed Jesus unto the day that he was taken up from us. That's his ascension. One of those must be one of these witnesses. And so what does Peter do? He applies godly wisdom to a situation. He knows what the Bible says, that there needs to be a replacement, and he applies the scriptures, he applies wisdom to this situation. You know, there's two sources of wisdom. God says that he can give us wisdom from above. James 1.5, you know that passage. 
That they that lack wisdom, let them ask of God. They give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not. They narrow down the choices with wisdom simply based on deduction. You know, I really believe that it wasn't as if they had a pool of men that fit the criteria and they just arbitrarily picked two. Uh, my personal belief, although I can't necessarily go to Scripture and prove it, but my personal belief, opinion, is that there was probably only two men in the 120 that fit the criteria. They weren't just arbitrarily picking two men that, that fit the criteria. They were probably the only ones that did did fit the criteria of walking with Jesus since the baptism until they saw the ascended Lord. And so God gives us wisdom from above. By the way, there is a difference between relying on wisdom from above and leaning to our own understanding. What I've often found, I should say often, but I've seen from time to time believers saying, oh, I'm just exercising wisdom when they're really leaning into their own understanding. Be sure you're not confusing the two. And the prayer ought to be, Lord, help me to make this decision with your priorities in mind, not with my own inclinations. Lord, make sure that it's not my selfish or sinful desires that I'm putting at the forefront of this decision. Lord, I want to make a decision that furthers your ultimate plan for my life, no matter how difficult it may be, no matter what you would have me to do, no matter where you would want me to go. I want to go where you want me to go. I want to do what you want me to do. I want what you want. Give me wisdom from above. Hey, they were continuing in prayer for 10 days. Do you think in those prayers they'd ask God, God, give us some help, give us some wisdom on making this decision? I can sure assuredly tell you they did. They asked the Lord to help them in this decision-making process. So godly wisdom comes from above, but also godly wisdom comes from others. Godly wisdom comes from others. Notice what he says in verse 23, and they... It's been Peter all along making this speech about what they need to do based on scriptures. But when you get to verse number 23, the pronouns change and it's, and they appointed to. Peter was the leader. By the way, can I just say this? It is so vital for leaders to know the scriptures. It is so vital for fathers to know the scriptures. It's vital, obviously, for everyone, but especially those that make decisions and are leading and making decisions for a family, for a pastor who's making decisions for a church and leading a church. It is vital when the leader steps up that he knows what God says about a certain matter. Hey, it was Peter that stood up and said, the scripture must be fulfilled. Hey, there's a burden on the shoulders of leaders in this room that we know God's heart and God's word to help lead the people under us in making good, godly decisions. But Peter makes a decision in accordance with God's word, but it's not just him that makes the decisions. The Bible says, and they appointed to. Here it is. Peter sets the biblical precedent, but they get others involved in on the process. Here's what Proverbs 11:14 says, where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors there is safety. Hey, you have a big decision coming up, a decision for your family, a decision for work or for move, you better be praying. You better consult the scriptures, the principles of God's word, and you better consult wisdom, wisdom from above and the wisdom of other counselors that are walking with the Lord, praying with you and wanting God's will in your life. Those are the principles here in this text. They nominated two names. Uh, notice again in verse number 23, and they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. All right, so Joseph had another name, Barsabbas, and he had another name, Justice, maybe they didn't pick him because he had too many names. I don't know. He's the guy with all the nicknames, all right? And there's just Matthias. I guess he just has one name, all right? So the three-name guy and then the guy with one name. We'll just say simply Justice and Matthias. How do they arrive at these names is not apparent, but like I already told you tonight, I believe that maybe these were the only two that fit the criteria for being an apostle. That's what I personally believe. And so Peter was a spokesperson, and they gathered together in consultation for wisdom. There's this popular evangelical author. I won't say his name tonight, but if you want to catch me afterwards, I'll be glad to tell you. Uh, in one of his books, he writes of this hypothetical case of a guy named Herb. And Herb is at a crossroads in his life because he's trying to decide who to marry. He's trying to decide if he should marry Jane or if he should marry Betty. And here's what the writer says, quote, If indeed all things are equal... And there are no biblical principles to prohibit marriage to Jane or Betty, then Herbert may conclude that marriage to either woman is legitimate is a legitimate option. 
It is neither right nor wrong biblically to marry or not marry either one. Herb should recognize that he would not be wrong in marrying either Jane or Betty. Thus, Herb, he continues, has the right within the options that God has left him to decide for Betty or Jane purely, and he highlights this as a point of emphasis, purely on a preferential basis. Church, can I tell you, there's a great danger in buying into that type of philosophy. There's a great danger in buying into that view of the will of God. We looked at it last week, how Gary Friesen wrote that book in 1980, that there's a, there's a contrary view to the traditional view of God's will, that as long as the options look good and as long as none of them clearly contradict God's word, just choose whatever you think is good and it'll be work out just fine. That is so contrary to the principles of God's word. God has a will that is knowable, discernible, and executable. It's not just make the best choice. No, God has one choice in mind for you. It's not good enough just to have two legitimate options or choices. No, they recognize that God had one of these men in mind. They had one of the, God had one of these men that he had specifically chosen to be an apostle. It wasn't good enough to have two legitimate choices. Wisdom from above and from others led them to two, but they recognized God has one of these in mind. God has one of these in mind. So fourthly tonight, discerning God's will requires the choice being given to the Lord. Discerning God's will requires the choice being given to the Lord. To the Lord. After they had continued in prayer, after they had consulted the scriptures to make sure there was no contradiction in what the scripture says, after they had consulted wisdom, wisdom from above, and wisdom from within the body, look at what verse number 24 says. This is really crucial. This is really important. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two, and here's the three words, Thou hast chosen. You know what that tells me? God has a specific, individual, knowable, discernible, and executable will for your life and for my life. It's not good enough to have two good choices. God has one choice he wants you to make. So you better know what it is God would have you to do. And he's not left you in the dark. He's given you pointers and markers and guides throughout all of Scripture to make God's choice in your life. God has a specific will for you. It's knowable, it's discernible, and it's executable. What was their prayer? Their prayer said, Lord, we, we've got two here. But we don't want to just choose what we think is best. We want your choice. We want the one that you have chosen. You have a decision coming out. You better continue in prayer. You better consult the scriptures. You better consult wisdom from above and from others that want God's will in your life. And then you better give the choice, not to your preferential basis, but you better give the choice to the Lord. You better say, it's not about what I want in this situation, what my preferences are. Lord, what it is, what is it that you would have me to do? Notice verse 25, they're continuing in prayer, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, there's the office, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. There's a really sombering, sobering, and shocking phrase there. He talks about Judas, they're praying about Judas, and and they say, listen, he was chosen of us, and he fell because of his sin, and he will go to his, or he is in his own place. That last phrase that I did study of that word is very, very humbling. That his own place is the idea of it's the place where he belongs. The place that is his own, of his own choosing. It belongs to them. Because Judas rejected Jesus, he spends eternity in a place called hell. Not because God is mean-spirited. It's because he chose that place because of his rejection of Christ. Your sins send you to an eternity, an eternal destiny in hell, if we don't accept the grace that God offers through his son, Jesus Christ. And Judas, because of his rejection of Jesus, went to his own place, the place of his own choosing. Discerning God's will, church, requires us giving the choice to the Lord. It requires the continuance of prayer, the the consultation of Scripture, and the consultation of wisdom. But finally, tonight, or or fifthly tonight, I want you to see in the next verse, notice verse number 26. 
And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So discerning God's will requires the casting of lots. Just kidding. Don't write that down. It doesn't require the casting of lots. It requires, number five, the consideration of providence. You know, this is a part in Acts where we really have to have a little family discussion. Because there are some people that will look at the book of Acts simply as prescriptive. Everything that Acts says, we must follow and do to the T. But let me remind you, as we introduced in the first message in the book of Acts, Acts is primarily history. It's primarily a book of transition from the Old Testament into this church age. And most of it is description, not prescription. Although there are great places in which we are prescribed several things. And so prescription and description often go hand in hand together, but we need discernment on understanding when something is being described as something that was done and something that is being prescribed, something that we should do today. And so when we come to this place where they have all these pointers, they're consulting scripture, they're continuing to pray, they get everyone together, they consult wisdom, they give the choice to the Lord, and then they flip a coin. Does that seem a little odd to you? Does that seem like, where in the world did that come from? Uh, again, I want you to understand what lots are so we can have an understanding of what's happening in this passage. We don't use lots today. You don't make decisions by flipping coins or by throwing dice. You know, I don't think you do. I don't think you say, hey, honey, where do you want to go out to eat? Let's flip a coin. Or we don't do that when we elect pastors to a church or deacons. Wouldn't that be great? Church annual business meeting. How do we elect deacons? Let's throw the dice down the aisle, right? And that's how we'll figure out who the deacons are. We don't do that today. And so why don't we do that today? Well, here it is. Lots. Let's talk about lots for a moment. They're mentioned about 70 times in the Old Testament. In fact, lots was a principle that wasn't really made up by men. God himself instituted that. He told the children of Israel when they go to the land, it's found in Numbers 26 and 33, it's found in the book of Joshua, all over the Old Testament, that they were to cast lots in order to make certain types of decisions. It's used even uh, various times in the New Testament, although this is the last time you'll see it used in the New Testament. We'll explain why that is in just a moment. But as they were to cast these lots, it was a God-instituted way of making decisions in the Old Testament, and there were two parameters for casting lots. And these are important to keep in mind. Number one, the first parameter for casting lots was that lots were never to be cast for a moral decision. You'll never see lots associated with a moral decision. By the way, a lot of the decisions we make today have moral implications, don't they? And, and those decisions are never to be left up to chance. And they were never to be left up to chance even in the Old Testament. You're never to cast lots because, because you're making a decision that has moral value. Number two, the second parameter for casting lots is you were never to cast lots to determine something that God had already said. If God had already explicitly stated it, you weren't to cast lots to figure out if God really wanted you to do that. You know, we often do that. God has said something in his word, and we're like, you know, God, if you really want me to do this, make this happen, right? God's, you've already prohibited this in my life, but maybe you want me to do it, and maybe you're going against your word, so maybe let's, maybe just, we'll flip this coin, or you'll make a miracle happen, or maybe I'll see a red car that goes by, and you've seen like four red cars go by, like, oh, that's, that's what God wants me to do, right? You are never to make a decision, if you're going to cast lots, here's your parameters, all right? <laughs> never make a moral decision based on casting lots, and never make a decision determining what God had already said. It was already settled. All right, and the governing principle for casting lots, this is a reference you'll want to mark down there in your notes, is Proverbs 16.33. It's integral. The, the apostles would have known this verse. The verse says this, The lot is cast into the lap. There's the action of rolling the dice or picking up the stones or, or, the, or the sticks. The lot is cast into the lap. And here's the phrase, But the whole disposing thereof, is of the Lord, a capital L-O-R-D. And here's what the Old Testament believer would have understood about casting lots. They were never doing it like a flip of a coin or as if they were just doing something out of chance or being left to chance. What they were doing in casting lots is they were letting God know or they were saying to God and to the witnesses, we don't know what decision to make, so we're going to give the decision to God. 
God controls everything, and he can control even the circumstances of these rocks or these stones or the dice or whatever it may be. What they were doing is they were not leaving something up to chance. They were acknowledging that God is involved in the affairs of man, and we want what God wants in this situation because he hasn't explicitly said, about, said something about this, nor is it a moral decision. So we cast lots. What casting lots of the Old Testament believer was was recognition that God controls everything and that we want to take into consideration the providential circumstances of God. And you say, well, Pastor Josh, I believe God controls circumstances, so I'm going to go ahead and cast lots and say, have that same outlook. Is that a good practice for you today? Um, I don't believe so. I don't believe so. There are some that would take that, that stance. But what I would take from this stance is that they recognize providence. They recognize that God controls the circumstances. They were seeing the circumstances through the lens of God's ultimate control and providence. And that principle ought to be in our life today, ought to be instilled in our, in our decision-making today. We ought to consider the providential working of God. God closes doors. And he opens doors. In fact, that analogy of closing doors and open doors is probably more aligned with the Old Testament casting of laws than the idea of flipping a coin or rolling dice. That's what we're acknowledging when God closes a door that we can't walk through or he opens a door that we can walk through. We ought to consider what God is providentially orchestrating, the, the scenario, the circumstances in our life. What we are saying is, Lord, we want to consult scripture. We want to continue to pray. We want to get godly counselors around us. We want to consult the wisdom that comes from above. We're going to pray him. We're going to give you the choice. And then if you allow a certain door to be closed, we're not going to try to barge in. We're not going to try to make our way or make a decision when you're obviously closing the door. That's the principle there. And church, I don't think we really struggle with point number five. I don't often hear Christians say things like, God opened the door or close, or God opened the door or closed this door. God allowed this circumstance to happen in my life and he's redirecting my steps. And so uh, I'm going to do the opposite of that. I don't really hear that too often. Here's what I think we do struggle with, though, is we misinterpret God's providence. We misinterpret the circumstances. Now, follow me on this. This consideration of circumstances is not at the top of the list. It's all the way at the bottom, and I think there's a reason for that as well. Because often, we look at the circumstances first rather than consulting the scriptures first. We often cons look at the circumstance before we consult wisdom. We look at the circumstance before we continue in a season of earnest prayer. And we're never to let that get out of the proper order. And what I often find is that when we're young in our faith or we're, we're growing in our knowledge of God's word, it often seems to be backwards. Because we don't have the knowledge of scripture and we're growing in that, we often are looking for the signs. We're often looking for the visions. We're often looking for things to happen miraculously. And by the way, God does miraculous things. God miraculously closes doors and opens doors. He does that. But that is farther down the list than the consultation of scripture. Our experiences and the circumstances ought to never trump what God says in his word and a season of prayer. And the danger is we overemphasize the circumstances while ignoring the other pointers. Uh, some time ago, a year or two ago, I, I was talking to someone and, and, um, and uh, it was a friend and they had said something, oh, you know, God opened this door for me. And as I began talking with this friend, I realized in my own heart that maybe it wasn't God that opened that door. It was something that would help them financially from the onset, from a human perspective. It may look like a wide open door and a great thing. But the more I spoke with this friend, I realized it was really going to inhibit him from maybe coming to church. It was going to inhibit him from really spending time with the Lord as he ought to spend time with the Lord. And I realized sometimes we blame things on God that really Satan puts in our life. And sometimes we blame things on Satan that God allows to happen in our life. You better be really careful about how you interpret circumstances. You better make sure that what, God, what decisions that you are making, that they are aligned with Scripture before they're aligned with your circumstances. It's easy to misinterpret circumstances. That's why the foundation must be 
God's word. In the infancy of growing in our walk with the Lord, we can sometimes put too much emphasis on the circumstances. And though those God may open and close doors, remember the order of importance, prayer and scripture. Prayer and scripture. In fact, I would say this. Listen, if there is a decision that needs to be made in my life, I have settled this with the Lord. If there are red pointers that come down from the sky and point to a specific decision, if all the miracles in the world happen at the same time, but the Bible says something different, I'm going to follow the Bible, not the circumstances. Don't get it backwards. But when we consult Scripture, we com- it's compatible with Scripture, the decisions we're making. We consulted wisdom from above and wisdom from others that want God's will in our life. We've given the decision to the Lord. We're continuing in a season of prayer. And then it, it's amazing how God then just works out the circumstances. Often he does open that door. It's obvious from heaven that God is obviously orchestrating this plan. And that's beautiful when that happens. It's glorious when that happens. And what that tells me is that I've been doing all the other things right for God to open that circumstance so that I can walk through that door and never get it backwards. Never get it backwards. They cast their lots, but it wasn't until they read the scriptures, they continued in prayer, they gathered together, had wisdom to narrow it down to Matthias and Justice, and then they said, Lord, the decision is yours. Tell us who you've chosen of these two men. And then they let the providence, the circumstances fall where they did. I want to show you the last thing here tonight. We'll close. It's not explicit in this text, but I think it is implicit um, in the beginning part of chapter 1 and especially in chapter number 2. Finally, I would say this, and I think this kind of helps us with this whole casting of lots thing. The final discernment that we need to have, the final way that we discern the will of God, what it requires, is is sixthly tonight, the counsel of the Spirit. The counsel of the Spirit. And as I was studying about this casting lots thing, I realized this is the last time in Scripture that you'll find the the casting of lots. And And it really dawned on me, I thought about that. They're waiting 10 days in this upper room to make this crucial decision. They're making this decision while they're waiting. And in chapter number one, the early part of chapter number one, Jesus said, wait until who comes? The Spirit. The Spirit. And in chapter number two, verse number one, at Pentecost, what comes? The Spirit of God indwells believers in chapter number two. So during this 10-day waiting period, who is not there? The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. Do you know who resides in us to help us make decisions that even the apostles at the end of chapter 1 did not have? The Spirit of God. And I think that may be some credence as to why they cast the lots. Because they did not have what you and I have. And that's the guidance and the counsel of the indwelling Spirit of God. And there is something that we possess. The world knows nothing about to help us make godly, wise decisions. And that's the Spirit of God that dwells in us. By the way. The Spirit of God is never contrary to the Word of God. I have heard people blame the Spirit's leading on decisions they were making that were poor, ungodly decisions. Do not be guilty of that sin of crediting to the Spirit what your own desires are. People said, oh, the Spirit's leading me to do this. And what the Spirit is so-called leading them to do is a violation of a known principle in God's Word. Do not be guilty of mocking God. Do not be guilty of lying about the Holy Spirit. And too often we try to spiritualize our decisions and say, oh, the God's leading me this way. And we throw that phrase around flippantly. You better make sure that you attribute to God what is truly God's. If the Spirit is guiding you, that's a great, great comfort. But make sure that the Spirit, as the Spirit leads you, He will always be aligned with the principles and teachings of God's word. And so casting of lots was accepted in the Old Testament. But before you cast lots to determine God's will, remember this is the last occurrence that you'll see because in chapter 2, what comes? The Spirit comes. And the Spirit, the Bible says, will guide us into all truth. Let me remind you that we have amazing pointers to the will of God. When the Spirit of God leads you, when the Holy Spirit is leading you, when the scriptures are giving you principles, when you're continuing in prayer, when you've consulted the wisdom of other godly leaders and other godly influences, and you've consulted the wisdom of God, when you've given the choice to the Lord, when you consider providence, and when you have the counsel of the Spirit, you can rest assured you're going to make decisions that are aligned with God's will. God has a knowable, discernible, and executable will. But we need to make sure 
our desires don't trump what God wants in our life. In fact, if you delight in him, the Bible says he will give you the desires of the heart. It's not that he'll give you whatever fleshly desires that you have. No, God will give you the desires that are his desires for you. In a jury trial, the attorneys try to discredit the adversary's witnesses. If they can convince the jury that their opponent's witnesses are questionable, they can win their case. And Luke gives us this account in chapter 1 of the credibility of the apostolic witness. These 12 apostles are going to be eye and ear witnesses of the majesty, ministry, resurrection of Jesus himself. And their witness is concrete. Matthias, history tells us, would end up in Georgia. Not Atlanta, Georgia, that Georgia, but the country of Georgia. Uh, the one that was actually invaded by Russia several years ago. History tells us that Matthias would go to that country. He would preach the gospel near an area called the Colchis, near the Black Sea, so powerfully and effectively that he was stoned and then he was beheaded for being a witness of the risen Christ. His ending was like most of the other apostles. If you go to that area of the world today, in fact, they say that you can find a marker near the ruins of a Roman fortress with his name, Matthias, engraved on it. This is believed to be his grave site. The apostles met the criteria of what it was to be an apostle. They were I and your witnesses of the risen Lord. And Luke is writing this account to show us the credibility of the apostolic witness. They didn't just choose a guy out of the hat. No, God was directing this decision consulted with a consultation of Scripture, with the getting of God's wisdom, acknowledging his providence that he had a choice in the matter. And through these initial witnesses plus the rest of the 120, the gospel of Jesus is going to go out in Jerusalem after this day of Pentecost. We're going to find out in a couple of weeks in chapter number two. It's going to go out through the ends of the earth. And may we learn from this example. We're not in the business of picking an apostle today. In fact, Ephesians chapter number two says that the apostles and the prophets laid the foundation and we are building on that foundation. If you step into chapter number four, it says that after the apostles and the prophets came evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's the gifts that we have today. We have different criteria. We don't have to see the risen Lord in person. We haven't seen him. But we are gifts. We are supposed to be uh, building and helping the believers of the local church being built up in their faith to carry out the work of the ministry and being witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so may we learn from this story, this valuable lesson of how to discern God's will. And in the decisions that you make today, tomorrow, this year in your life, may you follow the parameters that the apostles followed. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for... Uh, these verses in this early part of Acts and how these apostles had to make this crucial decision. And Lord, I pray that the pointers, the parameters, the guides that they use, uh, Lord, we would follow in their footsteps when we have to make decisions as well. May we be known as a people that know your word. May we be known as a people that are a praying people. We have your power because we're praying for your power and consulting you and not making decisions that are outside of your word. May we be known as a people that use godly wisdom in applying the scriptures. Lord, may we be known as a people that give the choice to you. May we be known as a people, Lord, that consider providence and a people that consult the Holy Spirit and let him lead in our life. And Father, if these be true of the individuals here at Kendall Park Baptist Church, Lord, I can rest assured that we'll make decisions that are godly decisions, your decisions that you want us to make in our life. Help us to go home from this place and throughout this week and make these right choices and apply your word to our heart. Thank you again for your word today as we've heard it taught and preached, the refreshing it was to our souls. May we go out this week and be witnesses of the risen Lord. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take your hymn books? We sang this song.